Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I have to confess, I will say I'm from the Devon Wildlife Trust, not the Somerset Wildlife Trust. Worse than that, I live on the southern side of Dartmoor, so I'm trespassing in every imaginable way. Uh, but as I drove over the hill this morning with Tony, being the taxi man, and I drove, drove us over the hill from Dun over Dunkery Beacon through the it was a rather grim cloud, let's face it, wasn't it? So, um, and, and down we came out of the cloud, and this unbelievable view um, opened up to me. And we could see in the distance Paulot Weir, and I last had that view in 1995. Uh, and at that time, uh, Paulot Weir obviously looked very, very different. And I just thought, wow, isn't this, are we incredibly lucky to have this place here uh, in the UK? Now, I've been asked to talk about the threats to wildlife and biodiversity, um, and I'm going to do that. I'm not just going to talk about threats, but I'm going to talk a bit about threats. I'm going to say some things which are probably going to be a bit controversial uh, to this audience, um, but I'm absolutely not here to bash farmers or fishermen or national park authorities or statutory agencies or anything else. Um, I've, in my previous job, uh, I was responsible for farm business in Oxfordshire on pretty decent soils, and I know a bit about how damn difficult it is to make farming work even in good situations. So at the at Devon Wildlife Trust, we have more than 20 farm advisors. We have three active farmers on our staff. Uh, so I think work, if there's one thing I'd love to come out of this conference, uh, it'd be a shift away from our binary thinking. Let's try and solve problems together. Anyway, to get started there, um, we have some incredible biodiversity in the world. Um, wildlife obviously translates into biodiversity, the total variety of living things. And what have we actually got? Well, uh, I read a paper last week using clever, the latest uh, computer modeling, which means it'll be out of debt in a couple of years, but anyway, um, it estimates 8.7 million species in the world. Extraordinary. But look at the numbers below, 2.3 million insects. So there's more <coughs> insects by far than any other form of life that we know. 1.5 million fungi. That always astonishes me, and it particularly astonishes me when you compare it with the number below that, 375,000 vascular plants. So there are, about, there are many times more fungi than there are vascular plants. 9,000 birds, 4,500-odd thousand mammals. But when we look at how we spend most of our time, what we think about, we think about conserving birds, we think about conserving plants, we think about conserving mammals. We spend very little time on these other far more numerous areas. And what's just popped up there, if you can see it, 86% undescribed. So most of these species we know very little about. And the same piece of work which came up with the 8.7 million figure estimates that it will take us a thousand years to describe all those species. And there's nothing there about marine. Uh, and that's because the marine figures are so unreliable. But one thing we do know is that more than 2,000 new marine species are trawled up every single year. And there are many deep ocean trenches, it's not just challenger depth off Japan, there are many deep ocean trenches where humans have never been. Um, I used to work at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. It'll always have a, a very uh, nice place in my, in my memory, in my heart, because that's where my wife and I met. <coughs> and we met uh, raising money in the mid-1990s for the Millennium Sea Bank Project. And the figure, all the scientists in Kew, you know, all the world experts on, on, on vascular plants, used for the total biodiversity of plants at that point was 250,000. And the scientists said at the time, that number will almost certainly come down, because you'll find that there was a botanist in the 1920s in Russia and one in the 1940s in Argentina who described the same plants uh, in, different, in different ways in the different times, and will realise that actually, it, you know, there's not two plants, there's one plant. But here we are in 2016 or 2017 when this report came out, and the number they're now talking about is 319,000. So it's gone up by about 30% in that time, just in that uh, quarter of a century. And in 2016 alone, 1,730 new vascular plants were discovered. I mean, how could they miss this? This massive drosera, this carnivorous plant in the uplands of Brazil, but they did. So there's so much that we don't yet know. Now, what this slide is, is talking about is, it's two things. It's partly where the greatest areas of biodiversity are, because biodiversity is not evenly spread, as we know. So there's an area here, um, the Cape Floristic region. And that area of a few tens of square miles has many times the number of 
flowering plants for the whole of the UK. Extraordinary biodiversity there. What this also shows is where there's the greatest threat to that biodiversity and sadly, those two things overlap in many, many places. So it's a sad sort of function of, of the modern world that the areas with the greatest diversity are very often the areas with the greatest threat. But you'll notice that the UK here doesn't actually feature. It's not an area of particularly high biodiversity. It's not an area of particular threat in the global context. So well, how does the UK feature in all this then? Well, we have about 70,000 species, so that's a little bit less than 1% of the whole world. But 20,000 insects, 1,500 flowering plants, 900 mosses and liverworts, wow. More mosses and liverworts than birds. But uh, if you look at these, we think about, say, the conservation priorities of this country. Uh, we have the RSPB, the biggest one of all, focusing on 620 birds. We have butterfly conservation, looking at 59 species. We have woodland trusts, looking at 50 species. Yes, of course, it's more complicated than that. There's more to woodlands than just trees. But what are we doing about these much, much more numerous number of species out there? So a point I just want to make here is, is we might just be addressing the tip of the iceberg in everything that we're doing and looking at. By the way, I should just say this is uh, Broughton Barrows, just uh, a few miles from the coast here. It is uh, supposedly uh, the most biodiverse parish in the whole of the United Kingdom. So we can boast something in, the, in this part of the world. Now, Exmoor, uh, wonderful Exmoor. Um, you have 198 species according to your wonderful Exmoor Wildlife Research and Monitoring Framework from which I have stolen liberally from this presentation. Um, and uh, here are a few of them. Uh, a lot of them rest in these areas here. So this is what I often and some people refer to as Atlantic rainforest. And we do have, I believe, rainforests in this part of the world and I think we should be really proud of it. We've got it in Dartmoor as well, we've got it in, C in Cumbria and parts of Wales and obviously South West Scotland. And I first remember coming here in 1977, I was 10 years old, and uh, my parents, my grandparents rather, lived in Paracoom, uh, they kept a holiday cottage there, and we used to holiday here as young children. And I remember coming to this as a 10 year old, and I was totally blown away, because living in Kent as I did, there was nothing like that there, the woods are totally different. Um, and this was just alive with these sort of magical uh, mosses, lichens, and the names of these things, river jelly lichen, I just love it. And, and these, these fantastic things, of course, you get in the marine environment as well. And uh, what fascinates me about the marine environment, because, of course, Sexmoor National Park is marine as well as, as land, is you have these, these life forms for which there is no direct analogy on land at all. And, of course, the reason for that is that life has existed for so much longer in the marine environment than it has on land. And despite that, our knowledge of it is so much less good. But despite all this wonderful diversity, we know that it's under threat, under severe threat. Less under threat in the UK than in some parts of the world, but nevertheless under threat. Now, every three years or so, I've gone slightly wrong with COVID, but ignore that, every three years or so, this amazing report comes out, the state of nature. Huge amount of science behind this. And the latest one, uh, about four years old now, uh, suggests that one in seven, one in seven of all UK species studied uh, are at risk of extinction. Now that's a pretty risky thought, one in seven at risk of extinction. <coughs> but I think we also need, we mustn't fall into the trap of looking at just what we've got. These are some species that there is good evidence that existed on Dartmoor, which I live on the edge of, in the 1850s. White-tailed eagle, great bustard, raptors, owls, all sorts of things you don't find there now. So we have lost a lot already. Now, as previous speakers have said, the world changes, new things come, old things go. But uh, I think when we look at biodiversity and conserving it, we have to embrace that change, but we also have to accept that what we are often trying to conserve is an impoverished system, which may be missing some key parts of the jigsaw. Now, this is a very controversial slide. Um, and what this, is, this is a, a bit of natural England work, and what this is showing is the state of our triple SIs. And the blue here is showing the state of triple SIs across the United Kingdom, all of them. And what we're seeing is a gradual decrease in favourable condition from about 45% here in 2007 to a few wobbles, but just below 40% in 2016. So in that 10 year period, you see a slight reduction in the number of the amount of uh, triple size in good condition. This one here, the green one, is, uh, is looking at Dartmoor. 
Now, this is not to pick on Dartmoor. This is uh, a feature that you will see in almost all upland landscapes. But you'll see it starts at about 30%, and it's pretty much halved by 2016. Now, as anyone from here knows, this is highly controversial in Dartmoor. Not everyone agrees with this. You know, it could be that we're measuring the wrong things. Uh, it could be that uh, there's something else going on. But however you look at it, we've got an issue here. And personally, I think we've got a slight existential issue with our uplands and what we think we should be doing with them. Now, change is a huge feature of national parks. So it's not just landscape change, we've also brought new things in, sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose, which have changed things. Here are some of them, again, from your, your excellent report. I won't talk in great detail about this. We all know about red energy, we all know about signal and growth, crayfish, mombrisha, etc. But there are others too, and I just wanted to mention pheasants. <coughs> um, now, pheasants are, are interesting. Uh, in, in some places, uh, the, total, the total number of pheasants in an area outweighs the sum total of all other wild birds. Now, pheasants don't go around predating on, on wild bird nests, of course, they don't do that kind of thing. But one of the things that often, we often forget about with, with things like uh, particularly intensive pheasant shoots is all the feeding that goes on. So we feed these birds, they fly around, they deposit their um, excrement, that changes the soil conditions. Uh, sometimes the soil pH. It has an impact long term on the whole environment. So sometimes these impacts are long term and are less obvious <coughs> to us. And the group that are most generally affected by these threats, these changes, are this sort, insects. Um, they make up, as I said uh, earlier on, much the biggest proportion of all our wildlife. They are also the most threatened. One of uh, the insects are going extinct at eight times the rate globally of mammals or birds, eight times the rate. And 41% of all insects are currently threatened with extinction, according to some science. And hence, we ran this campaign, we started this campaign about three years ago at the Wildlife Trust, and we coordinated it from Devon. Now, there are a number of reasons why insects are, are, are disappearing. I don't want to blame it all on this, but I just wanted to pick this particular one because I think it is relevant to the kind of conversations we need to have today. So, um, chemicals spread on the land have a big impact. We all know chemicals have a role, but they do have a big impact on, on our wildlife. Um, and I was chatting to someone uh, from, uh, from a farming background who was arguing to me quite recently that actually the total weight of pesticides thrown on the ground or just um, spread on the ground has gone down. And he was absolutely right, it has. But some other things have changed with that. The area which we cover with pesticides every year has gone up, has doubled over about 25 years. The number of applications of pesticides have gone up. The toxicity of pesticides have gone up. And now, uh, pretty much every river that's sampled in the United Kingdom, I used to work closely with the southwest water, pretty much every river um, has pesticide residues. And that's why southwest water actually pay us and West Country Rivers Trust and one or two others to help farmers uh, manage land in a slightly different way to try and reduce the, the runoff of pesticides in water because of course once it gets into the water it's expensive to get rid of and of course it has environmental impacts there. Mm -hmm. But the impact on, on insects is devastating from this. We also have some great threats going on in our marine environment. Don't worry, it gets less depressing in there. Um, we also have some great impacts going on in our marine environment. And we talk spend a lot of time talking about plastics, and rightly so, plastics are a big issue. But our, I would argue that there are at least two things which are more significant than plastics. And one is this. So this is um, dredging. Dredging happens all the way around the UK coasts. Um, this is two difference in two days. On the left you see a reef uh, there at the bottom. And on the right you see when this, these cones have gone through it and dredged out, in this case, the scallops. And it is, it is literally like dragging a plough, a deep plough, through a wild flat meadow. And the most frightening thing I find about this is that it can be going on right in front of you and you've no idea. You know, we'd all notice if someone clears fells a forest in ancient woodland. We all notice if someone sprays off a wildfly meadow. But this is often quite invisible to us. I think the other big thing uh, to look at is, is the amount of fishing we do. And again, this is not to knock the fishing industry. You know, the fishing is, is an important part of the management of our oceans. But if you look at globally, uh, uh, the impact of what we're doing, uh, it's illustrated well here. So this is uh, looking at, what this is looking at is the concept of total allowable catch. So when we were part of the EU, we had a common fisheries policy, we were part of that, um, then there was uh, allowable catch limits were 
set, arguably by science, probably more politically, uh, for each country. And, you'll, and this is showing the, the people who exceed that the most. You'll see Sweden comes first by some way, and the UK second. But that's just percentage. If you look at the tonnage, the UK is more than double the next one down, more than double. And that's because our total allowable catch to start with was much bigger than Sweden's. So we are taking a whole lot out of our seas, as well as disturbing the seabed. And the final threat I just wanted to look at is about climate change. And climate change was mentioned earlier on. Now this is obviously not quite a lot weird. This is on the southern end of Devon, very different. This is Dora Shwara. I was at a meeting just there, if you look on the slide, last night, talking about the future of the SIP. Now, in about six years ago, the Environment Agency did a lot of works to try and protect this bit. They put 800,000 tonnes of sand on it. Two years later, big storm, a whole lot was gone. And it will take a very, I would say, a, few, a small number of years before this will breach. What will happen to this bit? This is one of the most biodiverse places in the whole of the United Kingdom. More than 600 species you can find here. It may not look spectacular, but I can tell you from a wider point of view it is. What will happen? Will it disappear? Will it migrate up? We don't know. But what we do know is there's a railway on there, and that railway is unlikely to move, which means that as these things shift, they get squeezed. And that is a big problem right away across our coast. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'll just try and speed up a bit. Now, um, the question is, why does, why, why does this matter so much for the UK? Um, we don't have the greatest biodiversity, we don't have the greatest threat. Well, I would argue that we were the people who led our way into this. We led the Industrial Revolution. We led uh, the Green Revolution in many ways. Can we be the country that leads us out of this? And I think we should be. But here are some things we could do. So a few years ago, about three years ago, we launched Wildlife Trust um, this vision, Nature Covering Network, to bring back Britain's wildlife. It is deliberately showing uh, an urban landscape because we wanted to make the point that nature can live with humans everywhere. All right, maybe you don't want packs of wolves in London, not just here. But you know, there's no reason why you can't have birds and insects and, and meadows and everything else in a city like London. We have a challenge there um, because scientists tell us that we need 30% of the land to be covered uh, in recovery for nature. At the moment, what we've got is the orange slab, orange slice, 13%. Uh, current government plans add another 4%, taking us up to 17, which means we need another 13%, the green wedge there, to get to where we need to be if we want to hang on to the nature we've got. That's pretty scary. And slip over that because we're, we're running out of time. One of the things we've done as part of this, and counties across the UK are doing this, is mapping out, a, coming up with a nature recovery network map. And what this is doing is it's asking the question, first of all, what have you got? And secondly, what could you create? Because what you could you create will depend on uh, aspect and rainfall and soil type and geology and all these other factors. And then you can overlay this with things like uh, you know, flood alleviation, carbon sequestration, other data, and hopefully be able to answer what is the most sensible thing to do where. This is raw brush, but we can take it down right to a field by field basis if we need to. One other question, you know, if we're going to do this and double the amount of area for wildlife, can we do this and feed ourselves and grow timber and build the houses we undoubtedly need to build? It's a very difficult question. Well, if you ask Henry Dimbleby in the National Food Strategy, he answers yes. I don't know the answer, but he thinks that, that, that you can. And what he suggests is you have a three-compartment model. You have one third of land for semi-natural um, land, that's for wildlife, essentially. You have a third of land for low-yield, regenerative-style farming, which is much of what we see in national parks. And you have a third of land for high-yield farming. And he argues, uh, with, on backed up by evidence, that you can do this. Now there are some catches. One of the catches is that we probably need to eat less meat. Now that's a difficult thing to say in a place like this. But that is that's what, one of the arguments. Now I would just um, caveat that by saying that what he's probably talking about is intensive lowland indoor based meat systems, not extensive upland meat systems. Uh, the other catch is that you probably need to drive some high production indoors. Yeah, controversial, but there is technology allowing us to do this now. Um, so, difficult things. Do we want glass and steel structures in export? No, I don't think we do. But perhaps there is a place for them. 
And what we do need to bear in mind is that at the moment we are outsourcing a lot of this problem elsewhere. We are felling rainforests, plying up um, virgin uh, lands elsewhere in the world because we are outsourcing this problem elsewhere. I haven't got time to talk about this. I'll move quickly on. And I think just going to end then with some challenges to the National Park. I think when you're in a situation like this, most farmers, most people I talk to aren't happy with the status quo. So I think we need to take that road less travelled, to quote the previous speaker. I think we need to take some risks and shake things up a bit, and I don't think we should be too frightened of it. Of course, you've got to sort out the condition of uplands. You know, that's a, a, a whole subject for a whole debate, but yes, we need to do that. We need to be prepared to bring things back. So can we, say, double the area of this uh, wonderful Atlantic rainforest to Lexmoor? I think we can. I think we should try and do that. I think we should try and bring things back that we might have lost. They may not be the things that disappeared before, they may be something else. But we know we are operating with a system with key missing pieces from the jigsaw. So let's be brave, let's take some risks. And finally, I would say it's not all about the big stuff. A lot of it's about the small stuff. And there's a great, great man here. Every space in Britain must be used to help wildlife. You know, it's so difficult. I find myself listening to stuff and getting so depressed about things you can't change, whether it's in Ukraine or, or somewhere else. But then I think, well, actually, there are a lot of people doing things, great things, on a small level. And if more people did that, then I think we can make a big step forward in Exmoor and across the country to protecting our wildlife.